Hey guys, good to see you. Love you. Sorry, I can't be there with you today. I am kind of with you. I'm on, I'm on the screen. I mean, and I'm, and I'm, I'm not with you in body, but I'm with you in spirit. You'll actually hear those words today as we're diving into 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I will say, uh, before we even dive into the message, um, that, uh, that this will be the last time that you'll see me on a screen um, this year, um, uh, and that I'll be with you each Sunday as we finish out 2020. We've been in a season of, of, of running and going out to churches almost every Every uh, week, we've had teams going out, um, bringing encouragement and edification, a building up to the church. It's really needed right now. I don't know if you guys have heard about the the, the, the church statistics right now. Church is really struggling right now um, in America, and so we count it an honor um, as a sending church, as an apostolic hub, to be going and taking teams and to be bringing the good news of Jesus Christ. And so um, today we'll be in Redmond, Oregon. Um, um, be praying for us um, uh, as we're ministering. And so, yeah, once again, I'll be ministering in two places at once. Definitely bi- bi-locational, which is super cool, somewhat mystical. Um, but I can promise you this. We are going to have uh, uh, some fun today uh, diving into a pretty intense pa- passage. Uh, we're going to be talking about um, sexual sin. Uh, and once again, for the third week in a row, we'll be biting off an entire chunk of Scripture, uh, tackling the entire entire fifth chapter of First Corinthians. We're going to pray. Um, we're going to dive right into this, um, and, uh, and it'll, be, it'll be good. So Father, we just give you this time. Lord, we thank you for it today. We thank you, Lord, for your word. Father, I pray that I would have um, the humility and sincerity to be able to do this text justice. I pray that, uh, that I would be able to get out of my own way enough Uh, that Holy Spirit, you could speak loud and clear to bring healing, to bring conviction, to bring alignment and recalibration. Lord, we we give you this time, and God, we just pray that you would have your way, that Jesus would be glorified, that we would be built up as a church today. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen, amen. All right, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We are going through the entire book of 1 Corinthians, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. This is what we call expository teaching, exposition, which means that we dive into the Bible, okay, and we expound on it. The opposite of expounding on is imposing on. So it is our responsibility as ministers that whenever we teach the Bible, that we are not imposing ourselves upon the text, that we don't become dirty filters for the Bible or like a dirty window, but that we are allowing for the text to speak for itself, and that we are doing our job to connect this ancient text to the present, but that we are not changing it in order for it to adapt to the cultural norms of our day. That's going to be really important for me to say that right up front, because this is a very unpopular uh, chapter, and a chapter that most churches are not going to be preaching this chapter today, okay? Um, This is going to be a very unpopular chapter, perhaps maybe in chapter that some Christians might even tear right out of their Bible or take a sharpie to. Um, The context of this is the second issue, okay? The first issue that we've been studying for, for a long time, right? Five weeks on division. The very first thing, division, okay? And I felt, I feel like we've really thoroughly dealt with that, as, as, as good as we could have done. The next issue, it's going to come up this week, and then it's going to come up again in, in, in another couple of weeks. And it's the issue of sexual sin. Um, so let's dive in. Let's do this. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. It is reported that there is sexual immorality among you, okay? That there's sexual sin among you. Now, he's writing to Christians, Okay, again, context determines meaning. So whenever you read the Bible, you got to look at who's the author, it's Paul, who's he writing to? He's writing to believers, he's writing to the church in Corinth, and he's saying to the believers, okay, he's not saying to non-believers, okay, he's saying, okay, we are learning that there is sexual sin in the church, and check it out, he, he expounds, and of a kind it's not even tolerated 
among the pagans. And the pagans are into some pretty freaky stuff. <laughs> That's what he says. He says, for in this, what he, in this instance, a man has his father's wife. Oh, well, who? <laughs> right? Like, like, okay, what does that even mean? This is what I'm saying. In the church, there's a dude. He's in a sexual relationship with his stepmom. Gross, okay? <laughs> Nasty. All right, this is what it says here. Are you arrogant? This is what Paul says to the believers. Ought you to mourn for this? The reason why I'm saying this is that this is not secret sexual sin. Everybody knows. Everybody knows what's going on and nobody's doing anything. And Paul is saying like, shouldn't you all be repenting? Shouldn't you all be like dealing with this? And this is what he says. Let him who has done this be removed from you. Let this dude receive the right foot of fellowship. Right? Like, 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 like this dude should not be hearing, you are loved. And what works for you works for you. Whatever you're into, that's cool. You're in the church. Like, this is what Paul says. Get this homeboy out of the church. Okay? And this is what he says. Verse 3. For though absent in body, <laughs> like I am right now, he says, I am present in spirit as if present. He says, even though I'm not with you, yep, trust me, I'm with you, okay? And he says, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who has done such a thing. Now, I know what you're thinking. If you were here last week, you're like, Paul just pronounce judgment gosh that seems a little hypocritical like last week Paul you were saying that you could care less if anybody judges you and now here you are getting all judgy with this kid like Paul like the Bible says don't judge so why are you judging all right let's talk about judgment okay um Paul said last week I could care less if any of you judge me he says I don't even judge myself he said and the reason why I say that is because my conscience is clean there's nothing in me that is beating me up Okay, um, because Paul has done the work, it's not, he doesn't just have good theology, he has done the work with his theology. That means that his theology has actualized righteous living and that there is nothing that people or the enemy can do to condemn him because he's not a hypocrite, that he is giving a righteous word and he is living with righteous deeds, in that place, he's unjudgeable, except for at the very end, from the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says, however, for you, I'm about to get judgy. He says, I have already judged you. I have the right to judge you. He's even going to say in a second, I shouldn't even be having to judge you. You guys should have already judged this. He says, verse 4, when you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, this is where he's actually commissioning the church to judge sin within the church and this is what he's saying i am empowering you my spirit is present i am like your spiritual father as he said last week and not only is my spirit present my spirit is present with you as well as the spirit of christ jesus therefore you are enabled to deal with this verse five you are to this is the commandment you are to deliver this man to satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. This is what he says. You need to deal with this with such severity in the present so that you can save him from divine severity in the future. That if you can properly confront this with tough love, I'm talking tough, tough love, knowing that your toughest of love pales in comparison and will be dwarfed by the eschatological judgment that is to come. As tough as you can be on someone now, that is like child's play compared to the final day of the judgment of God. This is what he says. Hey, I dare you to bring on the toughest side of you and to do it now. Don't play around. Don't be the, oh, oh, oh. don't make this cute this is not cute this is ugly this is immoral this is serious you are to kick this guy out of the church give him over to satan for the destruction of his flesh but not to shame him 
And I know it sounds weird because a lot of times when church discipline is done, it's almost like it's almost like it's unto the end of shame in and of itself. And this is what Paul says. That this righteous judgment in the presence, in the present, is unto this final stage, phase, this final place of arrival, which is ultimately divine mercy. That because we did our job as righteous judges within the church, judging the righteous and the elect properly, that in the end, there can be the execution of divine mercy because of the immediate and present judgment. There can be repentance. There can be a new perspective. There can be a behavioral change. And in the end, this person that was in sin can find mercy before God. In verse 6, it says, your boasting is no good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump. You little lump, you. <laughs> and he says, as you are really unleavened, for Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with unleavened bread. This is what Paul says, that when it comes to sin, don't tolerate it. Why? A, a few people's unwise choices, that rebellion. Even in moderation, affects and infects the entire body. Rebellion, manipulation, is the sin of witchcraft. A little bit of tolerated Christian witchcraft contaminates the entire local church. Verse 9. I wrote to you my letter not even to associate with sexually immoral people, not speaking of sexually immoral people in the world or greedy, swindlers, idolaters. Since then, you wouldn't even be able to go out in the world. Verse 11, but now I'm actually writing to you not to associate with anyone who, who calls themselves a brother, anyone who calls himself a Christian, if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater or a viler, a drunkard or a swindler, don't even eat with such a person. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? It is not those inside the church. He goes, I'm sorry, it's a question. Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. All right. So are you in sin? Okay. Are you in sexual sin? Or are you greedy? Are you, are you um, uh, getting drunk? Are you um, being irresponsible, reckless? Are you taking advantage of people? Are you scamming people? Um, this is what Paul would say. Deal with it. <laughs> Deal with it. Deal with it among yourselves. Because tolerating it isn't love. Tolerating it is empowering sin. And so don't even chillax with one who bears the name brother for this reason, it is radically important that we protect the testimony of the church. It's actually one of the things that you agree to when you become a member at Seattle Revival Center. You actually check a box. You actually sign your name on an agreement that you'll protect the unity of the church. We talked about that last week. But that you'll also protect the testimony of the church, which means that if you've got a metaphorical SRC members only jacket, you're not just representing SRC. You're also representing the kingdom of God. 
And so for this reason, Paul is addressing here the context of sexual sin. Let's chat for a second. What is sexual sin? Sexual sin is any sexual engagement outside of covenant marriage. Okay? Any sort of sexual activity, stimulation, simulation outside of covenant marriage as defined biblically is sexual sin. And the problem here is not just sexual sin, but it is the tolerance, celebration, and pride of sexual sin. Here's the problem. When we sin, what we are saying is that, God, you might have your way, but my way, I believe, is better than your way. When we choose to sin, what we're actually saying is that even though my sin may have caused me pain in the past, and even though it might even cause me pain in the present, and even future pain, I am choosing to make this choice because of selfishness. Sin is always selfish, which is the opposite of love. However, righteous living and righteous choices, this is always engaged through a posture of love, which is where we give of ourselves not expecting any sort of satisfaction or pleasure in return. The church here is embracing sin. And the church today in America is likewise embracing sin. There are Christian, and I say that in parentheses, because um, what they're saying is actually very um, anti-Christ, who are basically Christian GLBTQ theologians that are going through the Bible and recontextualizing the Bible and at sometimes even removing things from sacred texts that are thousands of years old because they feel like it doesn't render well with today's culture. Again, these aren't unbelievers. These are those who say that they are believers. They are those who are wearing the name brother that would say that there is nothing wrong with sexual sin. It is not a sin. The problem with this is, you know, there are some pretty important guys in the Bible, guys like uh, Moses, okay? Moses, uh, pretty big deal, okay? Uh, We've got the books of Moses. Uh, Jesus, okay, pretty big deal. Got a bunch of... Books dedicated just to him, got the the Gospels. Paul, pretty big deal, wrote the majority of the New Testament. Um, All three, Moses, Jesus, Paul, they all address sexual sin. And we're talking about the same sins that are coming up today because there's no such thing as a new sin. There are just new ways of engaging with old and ancient sins. And so for this reason, it is radically important that we don't take our blueprint, we don't take a generational blueprint, we don't take a cultural blueprint, and we don't try to reconcile a worldly standard with a biblical standard. For in doing so, we fall into this, uh, um, we fall into this thing that took place in Corinth where they used their grace, they used their liberty to become far more immoral than even the pagans. Like even the pagans had enough of a moral framework that they had lines that they wouldn't cross. And now you've got Christians in in Corinth that are crossing sexual lines and boundaries that even the pagans wouldn't cross. Why? Because they've misinterpreted grace and now they are misrepresenting God in a very, very grievous way. When I was a kid, um, I had awesome parents. Okay, I have an awesome mom. Uh, My dad passed away in 2016. Absolutely love my dad. Um, In our family line, in the Stotts, Okay, I'm third generation Christian, but there was a sexual blueprint or sexual history 
um, that was pretty compromised, you know. And, um, you know, and there was a lot of grace. And the Lord did a lot of transformation in my grandpa. Uh, the Lord did a lot of transformation in my, in my dad. But I was kind of brought up in kind of more of a religious framework for sexuality that gave me a very clear what, but it didn't give me a very clear why. And I'll tell you what I mean. Um, I had my parents laid out very clearly and very biblically the boundary lines for sexuality and how it should be played out within marriage. And so when I saw this, I basically saw like, you know, you're a sexual being, but there should be no sexual activity outside of covenant marriage. Boom. You know, there, there, there you had it. But I didn't necessarily understand the rhythm of God and God's original intent for sexuality in that God has created marriage to reveal his own character and nature and to reveal the revelation of union to the world around us. For, okay, for example, okay, when Andrea and I got married, you know, I looked into Andrea's eyes and I was crying because I'm a crier. I'm a and Andrea's looking at me like, just, you know, stop crying and just start saying the vows. And, you know, I looked into Andrea's eyes. <laughs> and, um, and, and I remember saying, you know, in, in sickness and in health, poverty and wealth, okay, um, hopefully wealth, um, till death do us part, I love you with everything in my heart, and I swear, right? <laughs> Uh, so we did the vow thing. And what we were stating in front of our friends, in front of our family, in this legal union, we didn't just get married in our heart. We're married in our hearts. Yeah, no such thing, okay? Before the Lord, before the great cloud of witnesses, this is what we were saying. There's just you, there's just me, and from this day forward, our old identity is dead. We are now a new being. We are now one new man. We are now one body, one flesh, one soul, one spirit, one bank account, one, 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 one bed. There's no couch. There's one bed. <laughs> you know, these were things that we just defined right up front. These were the conversations that we had, you know, right up front. Before we even said, I do, we, we just laid all of this out. We entered into this. Now, when we did that, we represented on the earth the union of one body, one soul, one spirit, one mind between Christ and the church. That in the beginning, God created sexuality, and you have Adam, and you have Eve, and you have intimacy, and you have nakedness, and there is no shame, and their sexuality and union brings forth procreation because love creates. This mystery of when you have union, you have love, you have intimacy, you will have procreation and you will have growth and you will have health. And this is a rhythm that God has invited us into. And for this reason, Satan throws everything that he can at sexuality, trying to bring such sexual confusion and a misappropriation of sexual identity and to bring this people into such a place where, um, where there is no sort of uh, 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 biological sexual defining law that can govern by which how you even see yourself, that you can define for yourself your own sexual gender by how you feel, and you can identify as whatever sexual being you want to identify with from day to day. And there's so much confusion, and there's so much like, you know, how do we play this out? And then you've got a church that um, has completely lost any sort of moral compass where we think that love is tolerance. The problem with that is the Bible. The problem with that is the book of Corinthians and the epistles. The problem with that is, is the entire Old Testament where you've got a, a loving father pleading with his people, desperately trying to communicate 
the contents of his heart and desire for intimacy with his people and trying to lay out even a shadow rhythm with the Ten Commandments and all of these different things that we see that true love is truth, that true love is honesty, that true love is confrontation, true love is not tolerance, and true love is not ignorance, and true love is not just affirmation when we are doing things that are harmful to our bodies and harmful to other people's souls. Now, humans are the only created things that when they engage in this place of sexuality and sex, that they do so face to face, eyeball to eyeball, nose to nose, and mouth to mouth, the eyes, the very gates of the soul, two people coming together as one, image bearers invited into this place of covenant, sexuality, union, and intimacy ordered by God, ordered within a rhythm ordered within the context of purity. And when we violate this, um, we see biblically, and, and we'll be diving into this more, that when we violate God's sexual rhythm, that it is different from any other sin, and that we are violating our own body, our own soul, and our own spirit, and we are also violating the one that we are engaging in sex with, that we're not just in violating them, we are likewise violating their body, their soul, their spirit. It is a spiritual union without any sort of promise, without any sort of vows, without any sort of righteous intent before God. It is fleeting. It is momentary. It is all these chemicals that God has created to bring a bonding, and then there's not a bonding, and there's all this confusion, all of this heartbreak. There's this place of awakening love prematurely before its time, and it brings about a fracture of soul. And so I didn't understand this um, as, as a child. And being a, a teenage boy, there is just a lot going on uh, when you're going through um, adolescence and you're, you're a Christian and you're in youth group and you're being told, you know, do this, do that, don't do this, don't do that. And you're trying to be a good manager of self. And meanwhile, it just feels like, ah, like how do I even handle kind of everything um, that is going on? And for this reason, I want to do this just super quick, but I just want to pastor some of you here really, really quick. And so I just want to uh, address just a few people really quick. I want to address, first of all, um, all the young women uh, in, our, in our church and, um, uh, and all the young men that are single or you're old and single, and it is your desire to be married um, again, first of all, choose in your heart to not come into covenant marriage with someone who does not have covenant theology. In fact, I'll even go further. Don't um, align yourself to step into marriage um, with somebody that you are not equally yoked with. All right, equally yoked. What does that mean? Well, Pastor Darren, I'm going to marry him because he said he believes in Jesus and he went to church last Easter. Yeah, that's not called equally yoked. Why? Because when the enemy comes after you, you're going to be the one doing all the spiritual warfare. Meanwhile, you got your husband strapped on your back, and you're to be, you are supposed to be in battle together, praying together, believing together. If you've got a child that's sick, and you're contending for the healing of your child, and your spouse, I believe in Jesus, but I don't believe in healing, and I don't go to church, and I don't do this and that, you know, that just, come on, you know, if you're already married and you're already like God bless you awesome God's got a great plan for your marriage and I'm not trying to condemn it all I'm speaking to the single people do not marry someone that you are not equally yoked with and that means that when the enemy, not if the enemy comes, that means that when the enemy comes because Satan stinking hates marriage he hates it he hates it he hates it and it doesn't matter if you're a Christian or not. If you're married, Satan hates your marriage. He's coming after you. That when he comes, that both the man and the women, woman, they know how to do spiritual warfare. They know how to fight. They know how to fight together. And they are committed 
to revealing the character and nature of God through their marriage. All right, the next thing really quick is um, young people, old people, single people, if, if your desire is to get married, don't date unless you're ready for covenant marriage. Solomon would say, don't awaken love before it's time. That means if you're not ready to be married, you're not ready to be dating. Parents, if you've got kids in high school, they are not ready to be dating. How can you say that? Because they're not ready to be married. Okay? That dating or courtship is preparation for marriage. And it is the role of daddies to have conversations with their daughters and with their sons, laying out these parameters. Dad, schedule a date day with your daughter. Schedule a time to get together with your son. Hey, for the single moms, you are empowered to have this conversation as well. Begin talking with your sons, with your daughters. What is marriage? What is sexuality? Not just the rules, not just the what, but the rhythm of God, that there would be beauty purity and a marriage that reveals the faithfulness and the character and nature of God. Last but not least, I just want to chat with, uh, with everyone here today um, and specifically with people who are wrestling in some sort of sin cycle. And perhaps it might even be a sexual sin. Now look, I get it. You know, usually when sexual sin comes up at church, there can be a shame game at play. Listen, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus who don't walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. There's no condemnation here. There's no, there's no shame. But this is what I would say. We cannot be like the believers in Corinth, and we cannot be like a lot of the churches in America where we have arrogance and pride and tolerance for sexual sin in us and among us. So to the degree that this is taking place, we need to interrupt it. And did you know that you can? Did you know that you can be free? Uh, I had a, a young man meet with me and we met at a restaurant and he said, Pastor Darren, are you honestly telling me that I can be set free from the bondage of se sexual sin. Are you really telling me? Because I've never been told that before. I've always been told that I'm going to have to tolerate this bondage. And I said, you can absolutely be set free from the bondage of sexual sin. Absolutely. Okay? Um, uh, uh, I have been set free from the bondage of sexual sin by grace, through faith, in Christ alone. I didn't have a moment where it happened. I didn't have a moment where a demon uh, left me. But for me, it was a process of being strengthened by his grace. And there was a place of sanctification where a righteousness invisibly grew in me, where the spiritual fruit of self-control began to be developed over time. And I didn't make that fruit grow. I didn't make self-control grow. It was Jesus. I say that because I have experienced that. And God is no respecter of persons. It is his desire and his will to set you free and to grow a actualized, manifested righteousness inside of you. So how do you begin? I'm going to give you the solution right now. James 5.15. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. At the end of this service, the prayer ministry team, they'll come up, and I would invite you to come up. If you're a dude, find a dude. If you're a gal, a sister, find a sister. And when you come up, confess your sin. Say, Hi, I've been wrestling sexual sin. I, I've, been, I've been in an immoral relationship 
with my girlfriend. Or you could say, I've been in an immoral relationship with my wife. Or I've got a, a, a lot of sexual partners going on right now. Or I've got a pornography problem. Or I've got a, a, a romance novel addiction. Or I've got, and just come on up. And you know what we'll do? We'll turn the lights on. That James 5.15 says, therefore confess your sins one to another. Not so that you'll be shamed or rejected or told that you're a sinner. But no, 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 none of that. But that you would be healed. In his light, you'll be healed. He reveals so that he can heal. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. That, hey, find a brother, find a sister, find a spiritual mother, find a spiritual father, find somebody with maturity. What you don't need is to be affirmed in your sin. Oh, that's okay. Everybody does that. That's not what you need. You don't need a gay affirming church. You don't need to be told, oh, that's okay. Everybody, you know, goes that way. Every no, no, no. This is not what you need. What you need is somebody who values the word of God. Somebody that's not trying to change the word of God. Somebody that loves it. Somebody that's been changed by the word of God. Somebody that, that, that's got a giant's head. Somebody that's killed a Goliath. Somebody that's been through it. Somebody that's, 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 that's further along. They've got victory in the area that you need it. And you come in and with a smile on your face, you can say, I want to confess my sin to you. Would that be okay? You can say to them, I believe that the, that the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Find a safe place. Don't confess your sin to a fool. Find a safe place. Find a mother. Find a father. You're in a house full of mothers and fathers. You're in a house full of generals. Seattle Revival Center is a house of generals, a house of mothers and fathers. This is a family where you will not be rejected because of the decisions that you've made. You are loved by the Father, and you will be loved here. This is a safe place. It doesn't mean that everyone who comes here, that they're safe. You need to use wisdom. You need to use discernment. Please, by all means, lean on our pastoral staff. Lean on our pastors and elders. They are available and their hearts are open. But know this. At Seattle Revival Center, there is not a tolerance for sin and that we are not going to tolerate being reckless, being hurtful, slandering, divided, using our authority to manipulate others in order to get our own needs met, that we don't tolerate that sexually or financially, that it is our role as a church to serve people by loving people without any sort of manipulative expectation to get anything in return. And know this, that God is going to heal you so that you can come and bring healing to others. No shame, no condemnation, no pride. Yeah? Just on the count of three, let's just all say yes. One, two, three. Yes! Let's do it again. Everybody, I, I saw you in the back. I saw you in the back. You weren't, you didn't say it. One, two, three. Yes. We say yes to transparency. We say yes to true love. Not love that tolerates, but love that confronts in a spirit of gentleness. We say yes to righteousness. We say yes to relationship. We say Yes to God's righteous plan for the kind of sexuality within covenant marriage that glorifies and reveals the faithfulness of God. Let's pray. Father, we celebrate your amazing plan that there would be men and women 
created in your image and likeness, redeemed by the blood of your Son, and restored. And we thank you, Father, for your power that brings sexual restoration. And Father, I pray for a new blueprint today. I pray, Father, for a righteous replacement for any sort of perverted, hurtful, irresponsible blueprints that we were brought up into, especially any sort of religious blueprint that made sex to be a shameful, dirty thing. Father, we thank you that when you created men and women, that when you created marriage, when you created sexuality, you said, it is good. And Father, we pray that we would leave this place today stepping back into a place of intimacy with you so that we can truly be naked and have no shame. We thank you for your blood that washes us, the water of your word that cleanses our minds and imagination. And we thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit that is here today to regenerate our body, our soul, and our spirit. We declare our love and dependency for you. In Jesus' name.